RTD was keeping a little secret from the people you elected to run that government agency. Until today. The former city council president, who was cozy with developers, is now going to work for them. The FBI has a mystery about itself it cannot solve. But it's come to Denver looking for a solution. In search of the very first photo of this city. And a viewer explains why our You've Crossed a Line segment may be funny, but it's no joke. That's next. RTD doesn't just spend your money on trains. It also spends millions on lawyers for when the trains don't work. RTD's board just approved millions more in new legal fees for lawsuits, including the one that they've got going against their partners on the A-line. But RTD never told its elected leaders that a judge ruled they could have gotten those legal fees back, except for the fact that their lawyers were unprofessional. Here's Marshall Zellinger. RTD and DTP are back at it. Actually, the two acronyms have never stopped. DTP, the operator of the A-Line, is seeking $80 million in damages from RTD, meaning us taxpayers. We're being sued over the cost of A-Line delays, the cost of flaggers, and the cost of fixes required by the feds. In late May, RTD won a small portion of that lawsuit. The judge was ready to award RTD, meaning us taxpayers, some of our legal fees back, but did not because of what he called unprofessional handling by outside attorneys hired by RTD. Three weeks after the judge said they were unprofessional, RTD asked its board of directors to approve $4 million to be set aside to continue to hire outside attorneys, not just for this lawsuit, but other cases that come up. But the board was never told about a judge calling these specific attorneys unprofessional. The board was not notified of the order because we typically don't notify the board of every order or filing or motion of all of the litigation that our council team manages or we would inundate them with information. RTD did not have a dollar amount for how much we could have been reimbursed. We would expect our outside council to conduct themselves professionally. In this particular case, they were talked to about this. I wouldn't say it's normal. Uh, generally, uh, attorneys are not are not told by the court essentially that they need to play better. The judge in this case took issue with a few adjectives. One of them was when RTD's attorneys called DTP's position absurd. Because of that, the judge denied costs to be reimbursed. It's generally much better to just say that you think that they're incorrect, that legally they're not on solid ground, something like that. If you're going to be called unprofessional, I'm going to use children's blocks in the story. Uh, so you heard that none of the board members had been notified about this when they were asked to vote on June 18th for four million more dollars for outside counsel. Again, not just this case, but multiple cases. Guess what, Kyle? After I started calling every single board member today, yeah. before I got through all of them, they got an email from RTD notifying them about what I was talking about. Here's the motion. Here's the ruling. Here's where we stand with that. <laughs> Marshall's at the door. Quick, tell everybody what they need to know. Fascinating the way that that got rolling. Thank you, Marshall. Hope that everybody's recovering from their hangover from the fiscal new year yesterday. Probably partied hard. State government, like many others and some businesses, run on a July 1st to June 31st calendar. So yesterday was the first day of the new fiscal year. It, it's pretty convenient for Colorado since our legislative session where the laws and the spending are decided runs from January to May. So make those decisions and then boom, here we go. New fiscal year. It's also the start of some new laws. 30 of the 454 bills signed during the session took effect yesterday. One of them closes a loophole we told you about here on Next. That loophole allowed adults to send sexually explicit text messages to 15, 16, 17 year olds so long as it didn't involve pictures. Well, sexting those kids is now illegal, photos or no photos. This is the bill that had the rare near-death experience. We were talking about it live on the air as it was happening. Democrats in a committee inexplicably killed this bill, and then they flipped their votes. They changed them and, and brought the thing back to life. Former City Council President Albus Brooks was upset by an underdog opponent who suggested that he was in the pocket of big developers. Today, Councilman Brooks announced his new job with a development and construction company. Brooks's final day on City Council this month will be his first day with Millinder White. He's going to go to work for his former campaign donor, focusing on business development for them. He'll serve on a leadership team with four people who gave him $1,000 donations for his campaign. So I'm guessing they'll get along well. The FBI has come to Denver in search of answers in a cold case of its own. The question they're examining 
why can't the FBI seem to hire a diverse group of agents? Here's our Allie Levine. FBI special agent. It's been an amazing, amazing career. Now that's a job title. It is just a regular, normal job. Working for a regular, normal employer. Uh, my, my career in the FBI has just been absolutely amazing. But even the FBI faces recruiting challenges. We're definitely below where we'd want to be. Diversity <sighs> at the top of the list. That's another area. We, we obviously want to hire more female agents. Today, when women make up half of the country's population, they account for only a fifth of special agents in the FBI. That's only grown 1% in four years. There's nothing that's preventing them from coming on and doing it. And while the population is nearly 40% minority, special agents in the FBI are only 18% minority. In four years, that number has only jumped 2%. The more diverse the population that you have in a room making a decision, the better those decisions turn out to be. So why are those numbers not seeing significant change? That's, that, we're asking the same question. <laughs> For some women, I think one of the bigger obstacles is feeling the pressure of balancing your work life with your home life. Zay smith Berte says she made it work with the help of family and the FBI. There's a way to balance that and still give 100% to your family and 100% to this mission. We could definitely use more female agents. I mean, they, they really bring skill sets to the table. They bring a different perspective, different mindset. Diversity in gender, race, ethnicity, culture, and background. The FBI is looking for it all. We need people from all walks of life with all different kinds of experiences. The FBI has a diversity agent recruiting event in August. They say that you have to be between 23 and 36 years old and have either a bachelor's degree with two years of work experience or a master's degree with one year of work experience. And you can find more information on how to apply on our website. Kyle. I'm curious, Allie, why they've come to Denver for this particular initiative, because, I mean, this city is not exactly a bastion of diversity. They did actually say that to us, that, you know, we don't have the most diverse pool to choose from, and they're not trying to change the demographics. They're just trying to make sure that their agency reflects the community. All right, Allie Veen, thank you very much. Former Governor John Hickenlooper's presidential campaign is losing some key players as he struggles to poll above zero. His campaign manager, his finance director, and his spokeswoman are all leaving. And if Hick was going on MSNBC this morning to reassure supporters after that news broke, something tells me this didn't do it. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not always the, the perfect spokesperson for my, own, <laughs> for my own ideas. You know, I've got to get better at painting that bigger picture so, so people do hear it and, and see it uh, and understand the clarity. It sounds like you don't think it's, it's necessarily the message. It sounds like you think it's the messenger. No, no, I think it's, I think it's a little of the message, a little of the messenger, a little bit of the team. Well, now, now the team's gone, so we're down to just message and messenger. So we're about to find out which one it is. More Democrats are now calling for Hickenlooper to just quit the presidential race altogether and instead run for Senate against Cory Gardner. Now, there's the pesky little issue that Hickenlooper has said he does not want to be in the Senate and that he isn't cut out to be a senator. And then there's the crowded field of candidates already in that race. You got two of them, Michael Johnston and Dan Bayer, who have opening fundraising totals of more than a million dollars. I mean, those are serious candidates. They might, might not take too kindly to being pushed out of the race by a guy who doesn't actually want the job. I asked Johnston about that when he announced in January. Would you clear the race if he wants in? Uh, I don't know that. I'd, I'd certainly be willing to talk to him about it. John Hickler and I are friends. I'm, I'm a big fan, and so I think he's got big, bigger things in store than this race. But if he called me to have that conversation, I'd certainly be willing to talk to him. Hick would make a baker's dozen in the race. There are 12 announced Democrats running against Gardner. Along with Johnston, we have heard here from Alice Madden, Andrew Romanoff, Dan Baer, and John Walsh. All of those full, unedited interviews are waiting for you on the next YouTube channel. My recommended read today is not an easy one, but it's important if you're willing to take a look. It's a personal essay from Sage Nauman, who works with Senate Republicans over at the state capitol. It's Sage's story of how he lost his mother to alcoholism three years ago today. The piece is about the blur of moments that he remembers when he realized that his mother was near her end. He begs people not to be silent when they suspect that someone might be an addict, to take that uncomfortable step of saying something. 
And I was moved by Sage's pledge that today is the one day a year that he sets aside for mourning his mother. He spends the other 364 trying to make her proud. You can find a link to Sage Nauman's writing on the next Facebook page. So our parking shaming segment, you've crossed the line. It, it pokes some fun, but we told you from the start it was based on serious issues. I mean, if you take two spaces, you're making Colorado's parking problems worse. And if you cross the line next to next viewer Curtis Wolf, you might strand him somewhere. He shared these photos from a recent trip to the Thornton Crossing shopping plaza. Curtis told uh, next that he, he made a joke to his caregiver after he parked there saying he finally found a handicapped parking space that wasn't already taken, but he bet that somebody would park on the lines right next to him and lo and behold, someone did. So I'd like to share just one line of extra feedback from Curtis tonight. Next time you see somebody cross the line, Curtis wrote to us as a person who drives but has to use a wheelchair. Crossing the line segments are awesome and appreciate it. They used to call Denver a cow town. I'm not sure I even see cows. It's interesting to think of Denver as just this, you know, tiny, you know, few plots of, of land that people were, you know, just building these rough hewn cabins on. Is this the very first photo taken of Denver? And a Jeep driver with lots of confidence learns that's not how you Colorado. Next. Nice to be talking and showing you water instead of fire this July as compared to last year and the year before Colorado no longer in a drought and another beautiful summer day with seasonal highs in the mid 80s. We started off with morning sunshine, afternoon thunder showers, gentle, nothing severe as of yet, but a brief heavy downpour, a little thunder and lightning still likely, especially for Weld County and those traveling I 25 up into Wyoming tonight. Little short wave coming through around 9 10 o'clock may kind of amplify the unstable atmosphere up that way. Lots of moisture to work with. With, but tomorrow a wind shift means less moisture for afternoon storms. So a warming and drying trend kicks off tomorrow and will lead us right into the 4th of July holiday. So Mother Nature may not have so many fireworks of her own plant for this year for a change, but not tonight. Lightning and rain a part of our forecast with lows in the upper 50s. Warm and dry tomorrow. Highs in the low 90s for the 3rd and the 4th. 20 to 30 percent chance of thunderstorms for Friday and for Saturday. And a look ahead once again to that holiday forecast. A hot, dry day. Great day for outdoor activities. 
late in the day, maybe a little thunder and lightning right along the Front Range foothills. But all in all, pretty good, uh, pretty good holiday coming up, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. Uh -huh. So Inglewood uh, City, it just they keep dumping money into holes in the ground. For the third time in four years, heavy rain and flooding opened up a sinkhole near Santa Fe and Oxford. City says it'll cost about $1,000 to patch it up this time. A permanent solution for that spot they estimate at 11 million. The issue citywide is storm and sewer infrastructure. Inglewood thinks it has a 45 to $75 million problem. Right now, their storm sewer utility fund has less than a million dollars in it. You don't have to be a mathologist to know that Inglewood might be raising its water rates. So our reporter, Nine News reporter Liz Kotelik, was out at the sinkhole reporting for our morning show today when somebody walked up and handed her a beer. Early, I guess, but you know, to each their own. It was a can of Sergeant Sinkhole. Do you remember this story? Sergeant Sinkhole, the beer from Boggy Draw Brewery right across Hamden there. In June of 2015, a Sheridan Police Sergeant's cruiser fell into a sinkhole that opened to that same intersection. The Sergeant, Greg Miller, said it felt like he was hitting a wall when he just dropped through the bottom of the road. 15 foot nosedive. The brewers at Boggy Draw nearby invited him to come in and grab a beer and then to brew a beer with them. Sergeant Sinkhole was born. The most Colorado thing we saw today, bikes on bikes on bikes. All right, we've seen a bike attached to a motorcycle on Next before, but this is next level stuff out of Boulder. Tracy Rudnick spotted this motorcycle with a sidecar and a mounted bike, bike rack. Not one, but two bikes ready to go. I would say indeed, that's pretty Colorado. If you see something that just screams our state to you, get our attention with the hashtag hey next. From the most Colorado thing we've seen, to a lesson on how not to Colorado. Want to guess how it ends for this guy?
This next question was actually posed to the Denver Public Library. Someone wondering, is this the first photograph of Denver? Here's Special Collections Librarian Brian Trembeth with the answer. One of the things that really stood out for me is that it had those very rough hewn sort of, you know, what we think of as frontier buildings. But for me, the big tell was the wagon that had a team of oxen with it. When people made the pioneer journeys, they usually had oxen rather than horses or mules. The original's pretty, pretty yellowed. So this would be roughly, you know, 15th and Larimer, right around there. You know, we found that the photographer's name, Rufus E. Cable, is, was on our catalog record, but wasn't on, uh, on the photo itself. On the photo itself, it did have the initials REC, uh, which did stand for Rufus E. Cable. So it's under Photographers, Cable Rufus E. May have been the first to photograph Denver and other Colorado scenery. He had come out here with one of the early groups to establish a city in what would become Denver. And when we started looking into it, we found that there was really quite a bit uh, on the photographer Rufus Cable and uh, a lot that could put him in Denver during that time and really establish it as maybe not necessarily the first picture of Denver, but certainly one of the earliest that are known to be around. There's no bike lane on that street, I'll notice. Remember yesterday's story with the bike lane? Anyway, that photograph is not the only piece of Rufus Cable's legacy that remains. Back in 1859, Rufus and a buddy were down scouting land near what is now Colorado Springs. Rufus's friend, the Thirsty Stort, looked around and said, well, this spot would make a great beer garden. Rufus was like, beer garden? Why, it is a fit place for the gods to assemble. And that is how Garden of the Gods got its name. Way to be, Rufus. Jeeps and Jeep drivers, they're the tough sort, but they're not invincible. One offers an example of how not to Colorado. That, and those of you who caught me making a whopper of an error tonight, next.
This could be the most perfect example yet of how not to Colorado. A driver who thought he would cross the Dolores River with the four wheel drive. Well, maybe Aaron Edwards captured this video. This was uh, over the weekend in San Miguel County. Yeah, things go south right about there for the driver, and that is the point in which the Jeep becomes a boat. It's a bad boat, by the way. Aaron says some kayakers helped the driver get to shore. The San Miguel Sheriff's Office says that Jeep still sitting in the drink. So I misspoke in our fiscal calendar story this evening, and I referred to the date of June 31st, a day, of course, which does not exist. I thought maybe it would escape your notice, but Andy noticed and Bentley noticed and wrote in plus Harold and Susan and Rick and Don and John and Jim. So that was a pretty bad error, guys. But thanks as always for having my back. I'll see you next time.